Support for Think Humanities is brought to you by the Spalding University School of Creative and Professional Writing. Think Humanities, a podcast for people who love history, philosophy, culture, literature, civic dialogue, and the arts. Think Humanities from Kentucky Humanities, where we have been telling Kentucky's story for 49 years. Here's your host, Bill Goodman. According to the website Sports Conflict Institute, like much of society, professional American sports were segregated in the first part of the 20th century, preventing black athletes from competing with white athletes. In baseball, there were established Negro leagues for non-white players through the early 1950s. The National Basketball League officially integrated in 1950 while professional football started with integration from around 1900 to the 1930s. The National Football League was completely segregated from 1934 to 1945. The degree to which these degrading segregation policies hurt black communities in and outside of sports is immense, and not simply in the past. These official policies, explicit at the time, have affected communities in ways which have persisted through generations and still exist as more implicit racially segregated policies, says the author Mitchell Kiefer. Those examples in baseball, football, and the NBA are based on the history of segregation in the United States nationwide. What are the stories of sports segregation on a state level? What do we know about how African-Americans and whites played sports for the first half or more of the 20th century in Kentucky. That's the focus of today's Think Humanities podcast. Voices of the Segregated Past will soon be featured at the Kentucky Humanities Museum on Main Street exhibit in Glasgow, Kentucky in April, and I'll have more on that later. First, three of the men who grew up in small communities playing basketball and other sports, members of teams while they were growing up in junior high and high school that were all black, all African-American student bodies and sports teams. They are Clarence Glover, a member of the Kentucky Humanities Board of Directors, Charles Hunter, and Floyd Bridges. If you're a sports fan of a certain age and generation, you'll remember all three of these men for what they accomplished on the court and how they lived their lives after leaving organized sports. So, gentlemen, I just want to say thank you very much for honoring us with your presence today. And I'm going to start and ask uh, each one of you to introduce yourselves and uh, tell us a little bit about um, your playing days and what you did after that and uh, what you've been doing for the rest of your life. And let's talk uh, with uh, the one uh, person who still uh, is in Glasgow, uh, and that's Charles Hunter. And Charlie, a lot of people uh, remember you so well. Uh, Why don't you just tell us uh, a little bit about yourself? I'd like to thank you for this uh, opportunity to be, you know, participate in this podcast today. I would have to admit this is my first podcast. And uh, so, uh, bear with me if, I, if I'm not getting everything correct. You know, it's been a lot of years since I played the game. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I, I initially started, uh, well, first of all, I grew up in Glasgow, Kentucky, okay? And uh, I played my, uh, the only sport, well, I played two sports. I, I actually participated in two sports at Ralph Bunch High School here in Glasgow. Uh, I played uh, basketball and also uh ran cross country. Uh, I started playing basketball starting in 1959 to 1962. And I graduated from Ralph Bunch in 1962. Uh, I guess one would say I had a pretty good, the successful career playing basketball in my high school. Uh, uh, had a lot of awards. Uh, I guess it's one of the most memorable one that I would say would be uh, being uh, selected to play for the Kentucky All-Star team against Indiana in 1962. Uh, I uh, I led the uh, fifth region in scoring both my junior and senior year. Uh, I was also East-West All-Star. 
uh, I had received a number of scholarships coming out of Bunch uh, in 1962, which was, I would have to say during that time, Bill was somewhat unheard of for uh, an African-American to receive probably uh, a number of uh, Division I offers to go to college, to play basketball and to get an education. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get a number of offers from a number of uh, major uh, uh, Division I schools. And I will mention some of those being uh, the University of Louisville. I was uh, tagged as the first African-American to be recruited to play basketball at the University of Louisville. I had a teammate by the name of Jerry Wells, who was also an outstanding player. He was a year ahead of me. He graduated in 1961 and did not receive uh, very many offers to go to school. And I think one offer he might have received was to go to school at the Kentucky State uh, University. Uh, It was with Kentucky State College at that time, but is now university. Uh, He did not want to go. To Kentucky State. So he stayed around Glasgow and played in what they call the independent league. And uh, pretty much uh, that year, most of that year, he, he just stayed around. And uh, when I graduated in 1962, uh, we both went to, uh, went up and talked with the coaches there at UofL. And they indicated to Jerry that they could not offer him a scholarship. We both wanted to go to school together and play ball you know, like we did in high school. So we wanted to take that to another level and go to college and play as well. So it kind of made up my mind to uh, decide that I would go. And I received an offer from Oklahoma City University, which was one of the schools, along with uh, Cincinnati, uh, uh, Bradley University, believe it or not, uh, Vanderbilt University during that time might have been unheard of to be thinking about going and playing in the SEC. Uh, Murray State, I would probably been one of the first African-Americans to play at Murray State. Uh, it was uh, Kansas University. So these are just just a few of the schools uh, which I consider were, you know, were major uh, schools that are still prevalent today, you know, as uh, top basketball programs. Uh so I decided, along with Jerry, we decided to uh, to go to Oklahoma City University and play for Coach Abe Lemons, who was a very legendary coach uh, in Oklahoma and also later uh, became, uh, I guess, one of the first coaches, basketball coaches, to really get Texas University on the uh, – on the uh, scene, on the radar as being one of the top basketball schools at Texas, the Longhorns. So uh, Jerry and I, uh, we both uh, played four years at Oklahoma University, Oklahoma City University, I'm sorry. And uh, we were both fortunate enough to, uh, Jerry and I, both All-Americans there. uh, And uh, we participated in three we were not able to play varsity ball until our sophomore year. So we were able to play three years varsity basketball uh, and uh, also participate in NCAA tournaments all three of our varsity years at, at, a, at, a, at a very top level. Uh, our senior year, uh, we met uh, Texas Western, who you might remember, uh, uh, beat Kentucky, UK in the uh, championship game in the NCAA in 1966. And uh, and uh, we met Texas Western in the first round in NCAA. And uh, I guess they gave us our exit as well. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, but we had a, we both had a very good career. And I think we opened the door for a lot of the other uh young men that followed followed us to Oklahoma City from Ralph Bunch. And I'll let Floyd talk to you about that. And Jerry and I were both fortunate enough to be drafted in the NBA. He was drafted uh, second round by uh, Cincinnati Royals. And I was drafted by the Boston Celtics uh, fifth round. And uh, both attempted to play. I had an ankle injury that 
sidelined me where I wasn't able to continue my career in, at, at the NBA level. And Jerry was unfortunately drafted by the arms, armed services that uh, pretty much interfered with him continuing his uh, rookie year at Cincinnati. So uh, that's kind of, uh, kind of the, you know, uh, short and long of my starting my career and ending in my career uh, uh, as far as playing basketball. I had some opportunities also to play in the ABA that did not turn out well. I, I was with the Kentucky Colonels for a short time, and uh, but unfortunately, I didn't. I didn't make the team, but uh, I felt that you know that I had good opportunities to uh, to do what I always wanted to do. Uh, when I was growing up, is to play at the NBA level. Charlie, just very quickly, tell us a little bit about what you did after after ball, um, your professional life, and and when you. Uh, then return to Glasgow. Okay, uh, Bill, I, after playing basketball and after college, uh, uh, as I mentioned, I played for uh, the Boston Celtics for a short time. I, uh, I was able to start with them uh, and, and also uh, to start the uh, exhibition season prior and to the time that uh, when the ankle injury just got to the point where I could no longer uh participate after uh after uh <clears throat> leaving the celtics i had a, had a, a contract to play for the uh hartford caps which uh was the uh, eastern professional basketball league in hartford connecticut and i went there for about a couple of weeks or so I attempted to try to play and just just couldn't go bill the injury uh i learned later that i had torn ligaments in my ankle that uh did not I couldn't, didn't recover until maybe a year later after going through some therapy with that ankle. Uh, I started my professional career outside uh, of uh, basketball uh, in uh, academics. I was uh, started out as a teacher and basketball coach at the Atterbury Job Corps Center, right outside of Indianapolis there, down at uh, Atterbury, pretty close to Columbus, Indiana. Uh, I spent about, uh, I would say probably about 10 years plus working in uh, education and coaching, uh, I coached the basketball team, uh, probably about three or four years there. And after about 10 or plus years, I decided I want to look, take a look at another career. So I decided to look at industry and was fortunate enough to, uh, to receive an offer to go to work for Cummins Diesel Engine Company there in Columbus, Indiana, and spent about six years working in human resources uh, as a human resources uh, representative, and uh, later accepted another job working for Olin Corporation down in Lake Charles, Louisiana, as an employment supervisor and recruiter. Uh, I... uh, the time that I started to work for Olin Corporation, uh, things went pretty rough in the uh, Gulf Coast area. You might remember when the petrochemical and chemical industries all hit rock bottom during that time. And I was working for Olin, which was a chemical plant at that time, with about 1,300 employees. And uh, they uh, reduced that their staff probably to about three maybe about three or 400 employees. And I was mainly doing the recruiting for that facility. So as a recruiter and you're no longer hiring, you know what happens after that. Uh, so I was, I stayed in Lake Charles probably for about three years. My oldest daughter, Annetta Hunter, graduated there in, in Lake Charles. And uh, I have a younger daughter by the name of Nicole Hunter. And uh, she was relatively young. I think she was in elementary school during that time when I was in Lake Charles. I, uh, after, uh, uh, for a short time, I stayed in Lake Charles. uh, And after my daughter graduated, we relocated back to Glasgow. And I was probably here in Glasgow for about a month or so before I received an offer to go to work for Emhart Corporation. You might have been, you might remember, uh, Emhart uh, 
uh, which was a parent company of uh, the capacitor company here in Glasgow. Uh, the name of, uh, I'm trying to remember, you might help me out if you can remember that company that was here. Uh, uh, would it have been Tyson? N- no. no, not, um, not Tyson. Gosh, I, uh, I've forgotten those too, Charlie. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, they made capacitors yeah. here. Uh, but anyway, uh, it was uh, under that umbrella uh, at uh, MHART. And I went to work for them uh, at their corporate office there in Farmington, Connecticut, as a, as employment manager at the corporate office there. And uh, I'm going to say probably I, I, I made a lot of moves, Bill, during that time, because if you wanted to uh, probably get promotions during that time, you had to you had to move. And uh, a lot of times you had to take, you know, take different jobs, different companies to do that, uh, to get promotions. So, uh, and then that was a pretty rough time during the early eighties too, uh, with what was going on in, uh, you know, as far as the uh, world economy, uh, a lot of layoffs here in America. And, uh, unfortunately I was a victim of a lot of those layoffs working, working for, you know, uh, corp fortune 100 companies here in, in, in America. And, uh, uh, Leaving uh, after three years with uh, Emhart Corporation, uh, uh, Black and Decker, Black and Decker uh, bought them out. And uh, usually, you know, when a company buy another company out, if you're at the corporate office, you're probably going to be on that list to be leaving. So unfortunately, I was. <laughs> so uh, then I'm on, I'm looking for another job and uh, was fortunate enough to work for uh uh, Bechtel Corporation, uh, which was doing the big dig there in Boston. You might let have heard something about the big dig is when the central artery tunnel was being uh, constructed there in Boston. And I went to work uh, uh, as a employment manager uh, during the startup period for a Bechtel Corporation and uh, spent about a year there in Boston and uh, after the startup, uh, they were, had some layoffs, and uh, and I was re- I decided at that time, Bill, to relocate back to Glasgow. So I came back to Glasgow in uh, 1993, and uh, and worked for uh, for a little while. Uh, I worked for the uh, Great Onyx Job Corps Center after coming back here, uh, and. Uh, and I'm on the move again, left Job Corps, left Great Onyx, went to work for uh, Whitney Young Job Corps Center in Simpsonville, uh, Kentucky, right outside of Louisville. Spent about two years or so with them and came back to Glasgow. And uh, my last position before I retired was with uh, Western Kentucky University, Glasgow campus. And I worked there for about six years as an academic advisor. <laughs> retired and went fishing for about a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> well, gentlemen, um, we're going to take a quick pause right now for our underwriter at Spalding University. At Spalding University's School of Creative and Professional Writing, students develop mastery of the writing skills, highly prized in today's workplace, including arts and humanities organizations, government agencies, corporations, and small businesses. A professional writing student will explore opportunities writing for trade and consumer media, including reviews, profiles, interviews, and articles for sports, food, travel, health and science, and other publications. Learn more at spalding.edu slash school of writing or email school of writing at spalding.edu. Uh, Floyd Bridges, why don't uh, you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you, Bill, for, for having us on. And it's uh, it's also a privilege to be around these legends, uh, Charlie and, and, and Clarence also. We all kind of played together, kind of grew up together, and uh, really had a good time. And I guess, Bill, my biggest thing was uh, we kind of, I kind of followed in the footsteps of Charles. You know, he was uh, the the um, the uh, big hero at Ralph Bunch High School, and um, um, 
this uh, many sports accolades kind of motivated me and 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 and, and some other uh, young men to uh, to pursue basketball. And um, uh, Charles, that we we grew up together. We we lived on the same street, probably about a couple of doors down from each other. So you know, in essence, he was probably my idol in basketball. And once I saw his accomplishments, then I wanted to to have those. Uh, same accolades and 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 those accomplishments on, on my resume uh, per se. Um, the I guess the significant thing after Charlie left to um, go to Oklahoma in '62, then I guess the team was left up to me to 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 be the main star, or whatever. And uh, so we have the privilege of working with some younger guys. And um, uh, I guess our biggest achievement was winning the 19th district tournament in 1964. And as you know, um, Ralph Bunch, that was the last year of, of existence for Ralph Bunch High School. So it, it was kind of good to go out on a, on, on a positive note, something that all the great teams of Ralph Bunch never accomplished. And so I was fortunate to, to have, uh, 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 I guess, that milestone in, 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 uh, in, 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 in my resume, probably. Uh, also followed uh, Charlie to, to Oklahoma City which was a division one. And um, I also played on the East-West All-Star game in, in Lexington. And I had a lot of uh, scholarship offers. I won't go into all of those, but uh, I was um, mainly wanting to just go to college, I think. That was my main motivation. And, and, to, and to get an education, to, to basically just kind of um, uh, raise my standard of living or whatever we need. County grew up. We had a tremendous community support in Glasgow. Uh, everybody was was wanting what was best for you, and so you, you kind of come under that umbrella that you didn't want to really let anyone down. And so at that particular time, um, I think uh, Charlie and Jerry had had set the pace for for athlete, for athletic for athletics. And so, like I said, my main purpose was just going to college get an education and uh, come out into the world. Uh, uh, I had my, my secret admiration was to, to become an astronaut, believe it or not, uh, <laughs> Bill. But, you know, I, I grew like six, five. And so they didn't have the space shuttle. It wasn't large enough for me to, <laughs> to, to fit in. So I had to, I had to change my perspective and, and my whole career or whatever. But that was my really aspirations. And, and even today, I, Kind of follow the the, uh, the the space news and and kind of keep up with that and whatever. Uh, after I went to Oklahoma City, uh, I had the uh, the privilege of playing with Jerry and Charles. I was the sophomore, and when they was the senior, so I had, we had the privilege of playing that uh, 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 Texas Western particular game that that we got eliminated Oklahoma City, and then after that, um, I, I continued my education and. Um, uh, graduated from Oklahoma City University in 1968, and uh, uh, which was a major accomplishment. My uh, the first fam the first member of my family that graduated from college, so that was a, a, a tremendous accomplishment back then. Um, and after that, then I also followed Charlie once again, going to Edinburgh Job Corps Center, where I was a, a health instructor there and, and spent some time there and also became an academic counselor there. Uh, I stayed there a few years and then I came into um, the, the school public school system in Indianapolis, which was Wayne Township. And there I became a guidance counselor, uh, got my master's degree uh, from Indiana University and, and pursued the, the academic life. Um, and I guess my uh, aspiration was to just to kind of give back to young people what so many people had given to me and uh, uh, to help them out and guide them so they could have a, a successful life and, and a successful career in anything that they chose and, and opportunities. At that time, opportunities was really opening up for uh, uh, African-American males at that particular time. So I was fortunate to, um, to uh, get into the, the Indianapolis public school system and um, uh, I was hired by Wayne Township, which is um, at that time they had the desegregation was was coming in, and so um, they they hired me. And I was also a counselor 
and I uh, had the uh, opportunity to give back to some young kids uh, the the my expertise in in in, in basketball, and I found it a, a whole lot different being a coach as as compared to being a player. So that was that was a tremendous learning experience. Uh, my career ended up at uh, Ben Davis High School, which is the largest high school in in Indiana, and as a guidance counselor. And I spent about 10 years there. And uh, also, once again, to um, develop college potential uh, kids and to, to get them at, at the next level. Uh, after that, uh, I've, I've retired. And I've, I, I guess I, I've been in Indiana for about 40 plus years. Um, I, I, I only plan to stay about a couple of years. And, and so I've, I've ended up being in Indiana and in Naples, particularly for 40 some years. And uh, so then I've, I've retired from Ben Davis High School as as a, a academic counselor. And I also had the chance to do some administrative work. So I've really come full circle from a student to a player, to a, a, a coach, to an administrator, to a guidance counselor. And right now I'm, I'm present, retired and, and and uh, waiting on March Madness, Bill. <laughs> right there in Indianapolis, right? Right in Indianapolis, exactly. Floyd, who was on that 19th um, uh, regional uh, championship team uh, with you? Well, we had, uh, uh, I think, uh, Charlie and, and uh, Jerry had, had already graduated. So we had Alonzo Webb, Billy Joe Webb. Uh, we had uh, uh, Milton Depp. I think he's passed away now. And we had uh, Jerry Childress. He, he's still there. And uh, so, and we, we beat our nemesis, which was Allen County, which that that was a, a celebration within itself. <laughs> yeah. Now was uh, let me let's see, sixty four. McDaniel's was on that team, wasn't he? Yeah. Well, he was a freshman. Okay. I think that before he came, he came to uh, he went initial. He and Rick Starks went to Scottsville. And then they transferred to Allen County, I think. And then Rick came back to, to Scottsville. And so uh, he was he was a freshman, so I didn't get to play against him that much, which was, which was probably were good because he was about 6'9 uh, or 6'8 uh, uh, at that particular time in 1964. So he grew to be about seven foot. So uh, that, that was probably a good bypass, I guess, Bill. <laughs> Clarence Glover, uh, you've had a, a storied uh, career and and uh, a story uh, to tell. Just very briefly, because I do want to leave some time to talk about the booklet. Uh, uh, tell us um, uh, where you were when these gentlemen were were playing ball, and and uh, where you played, and then uh, your uh, fortune uh, that you discovered at, at Western, and then beyond that. Thanks, Bill. Uh, as you said very briefly. One very quick thing, I just want to go back. You mentioned to Floyd about 19th uh, region. There are only 16 regions in Kentucky. Floyd was mentioned that the 19th district was what he actually meant. One of the things, too, is that uh, Charles Big Game Hunter, I had heard about him as I go into a little bit about, about me. Uh, I never got to see him play, but I knew that he was great. Floyd Bridges, actually, I knew about him, but I met Floyd when I became the first black assistant principal in Wayne Township, Floyd was a counselor at another middle school in Wayne Township. So I spoke with the principal and said, would it work if uh, if we had Floyd Bridges to come over as a guidance counselor with me being the only black administrator or assistant principal in the entire school district? Uh, would it be looked upon as too many black males in this one school. Now, the tough thing is that I actually had to ask that question. is is interesting, but I did ask the question. He checked it out, and he said, it's fine with me. Let's offer Floyd the job. So I'll move from that. But Floyd and I worked together in Wayne Township uh, School District at Fourth and Junior High School uh, in the 1980s. As I move very quickly back through me, I, I grew up in Horse Cave, Kentucky. I attended the Horse Cave Colored School for up to the fourth grade, and, and, and we were one of the first school districts to integrate. So in fifth grade, I went into Caverna Independent School District, and that's where I met my mentor, Mr. Ralph Dorsey, 
who was the superintendent of schools, the basketball coach, and the baseball coach. I spent the years through high school at Caverna High School. I was fortunate enough to, to play in the regional tournament, the district tournament. I was named uh, an All-American, All-State, first team All-State, and made all the other teams from all conference, all the area, those type things. I attended Western Kentucky University, and as Mr. Hunter said, freshmen could not play in those years uh, on the varsity. So I played the varsity, grades 10, uh, grades sophomore through senior, along with my um, high school nemesis, who became my college teammate, Jim McDaniels. And Jim and I ended up going to West Kentucky University because he was actually the person behind wanting us to go to West Kentucky University as he and I played in the Kentucky All-Star Games together. And Mac, as I called him, said to the other guys that it would be great if we all went to the same school. Uh, initially, I held out. And then I then agreed. So it ended up that Jim McDaniels, Clarence Glover, uh, Jim Rose from Hazard, Jerome Perry from DuPont Manual in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, and Jerry Walsh from St. Xavier went to West Kentucky University. We felt that we could win a national championship there. Uh, long story short on that, it did not happen. But our sophomore year, we met, we did not even make the NIT. So we were a little disappointed in, in our performances. Junior year, we did much better. And I'll point out that we never, we had only senior class that never lost a game in the arena. We won every game for four years, even our freshman year in the arena. So we, uh, we went to the national tournament and met Jacksonville and Artis Gilmore in the very first game, the first round of the tournament. Uh, when we walked into the gymnasium, and of course, as, as Bill knows, Gilmore and I became friends after uh, college years. Um, I saw artist Gilmore at the other end of the court, and he had an interesting haircut with an Afro, uh, kind of pork chop sideburns, and a little bit of a goatee that added to his height. And my gosh, he, he was, my goodness, he was, was the most formidable looking opponent that I could think of. Our assistant coach, Buck Sidner, said to me, Clarence, when you saw Artis Gilmore, you turned pale and looked sick. And, <laughs> and I said to Coach Sidner, Coach, if I turned pale, I was sick. <laughs> you know? But I, my assignment was to guard Artis Gilmore. And, of course, uh, no one could really contain Artis, uh, one person anyhow. So they they beat us, and they went on to play, uh, of course, UK and the other schools, and end up in the finals of the NCAA tournament against NC against UCLA. Senior year, we came back, we played them in Louisville, Kentucky, Freedom Hall, and we beat them. Uh, and so then we got matched up with them at the end of the year, uh, first round again in the national tournament. They had us down to seventeen points in the first half. 14 points going in at halftime. People turned off the televisions. They cut off their their te uh, radios. This is actually what happened. And um, they gave up on us. Long story short, again, we we came back. We won the game on a last second impromptu play that I call the shoestring play, whereas I scored the final two points and we won and and we won the game. And Artis, of course, has forgiven me. Number one, draft, I was number one draft choice of the Boston Celtics um, and had the pleasure and privilege to, to participate in, and be a Boston Celtic, play, play in Boston Garden. I even had the opportunity to coach in golf Boston Garden as a high school basketball coach. I did my, I got my bachelor's degree in Western Kentucky, my master's degree at, at Boston State, my uh, I did my postgraduate studies at uh, Butler University in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I did my uh, doctoral work at IU and did not complete the doctorate there because I ran out of money. 
uh, finishing this up, I was a teacher, administrator, principal, assistant principal, principal, assistant superintendent, and retired in 2013. I will still be inducted into the Kentucky High School Basketball Hall of Fame on May 15th, 2021. We're a class of 2020, but the pandemic has not allowed us to be inducted yet officially. We're officially, we're officially in, but we have to be publicly inducted in May 15th, 2021. Well, uh, congratulations uh, uh, once again, Clarence. And uh, for those of you who are interested in hearing more about uh, Clarence, uh, we did a podcast a few weeks ago, and that's up on our website, and it's uh, on SoundCloud and iTunes. It's a fascinating story, and you will hear the almost second-by-second second, uh, account of the uh, the last second shot, uh, which is uh, worth the price of admission to hear uh, Clarence uh, relive that uh, once again for all of us. We We live it with him. Thanks to the men for sharing their stories. In part two of the podcast next week, we'll hear more from them and the booklet they've put together regarding voices of the segregated past. For Kentucky Humanities, I'm Bill Goodman. Think Humanities is a podcast from Kentucky Humanities, where we have been telling Kentucky's story for 49 years. Think Humanities is available at kyhumanities.org, iTunes, and SoundCloud. Join us next week for a new episode of Think Humanities. Support for Think Humanities is brought to you by the Spalding University School of Creative and Professional Writing. Think Humanities, a podcast for people who love history, philosophy, culture, literature, civic dialogue, and the arts. Think Humanities from Kentucky Humanities, where we have been telling Kentucky's story for 49 years. Here's your host, Bill Goodman. Hello again, and welcome to Think Humanities. Today, part two of our podcast, we began last week featuring a museum on Main Street exhibit at the Barron County Cultural Center in Glasgow. Crossroads is the name of the museum on Main Street, Changes in Rural America. Many Americans assume that rural communities are endangered and hanging on by a thread, suffering from out-migration, ailing schools, and overused land. But that perception is far from true in many areas. Many rural Americans work hard to sustain their communities. Why should revitalizing the rural places left behind matter to those who remain, those who have left their rural areas, and those who will come in the future? That's what this exhibit is intended to do, make you think about rural America and its future. The exhibit in Glasgow also features an added bonus. Voices of the Segregated Past will soon be featured at the Kentucky Humanities Museum on Main Street exhibit in Glasgow in April, and I'll have more on that later. First, three of the men who grew up in small communities playing basketball and other sports. Members of teams while they were growing up in junior high school and high school that were all black, all African-American student bodies and sports teams. The men are Clarence Glover, a member of the Kentucky Humanities Board of Directors, Charles Hunter and Floyd Bridges. If you're a sports fan of a certain age and generation, you'll remember all three of these men for what they accomplished on the court and how they lived their lives after leaving organized sports. Here's more of that conversation. Uh, Charlie, the the reason that uh, just to remind folks that we're talking uh, with with you um, and uh, the other names, I certainly don't want to uh, leave out Rick Starks. You mentioned Rick, but uh, James Stockton, who's I believe in uh, in Boston, he was a a big part of this uh this booklet that we're calling that you're calling voices of the segregated past and what uh, uh, just tell me, first of all, what you were trying to do with that booklet. Um, And I'm going to tell folks how they can see it. And, um, and maybe even uh, uh, well, we'll, we'll leave that for just uh, in a few minutes, but what, what is voices of the segregated past to Charles Hunter? Okay, Bill. um, I was approached by, uh, Alonzo Webb and Rick Starks to uh, to become a member of the what is now called the East 41 committee. 
And uh, so they had asked me what I considered, you know, being a member of that committee. And I told them I would. And uh, and our first meeting was at Rick's house at his home there in Bowling Green. And uh, and so they informed me, at least Lonnie informed me that uh, it was, uh, I think, his vision that he took to Rick to talk about players that probably have been forgotten, probably never was mentioned, playing back during the time that uh, athletic sports in Kentucky, had, as well as uh, schools, high schools, schools as, as a whole, was segregated. So uh, both Rick and, and Alonzo said what they would like to accomplish was to tell the story of about, I guess their main focus was living players that they all wanted to interview, that we wanted to interview and get their, uh, their, I guess their feelings, how things were back then, things that they experienced and just to, uh, just to give us some insights, you know, on, on how difficult it was to, uh, for them to, uh, to uh, participate in athletics, you know, with the conditions that were prevalent there uh, during that time. And uh, so mainly uh, we wanted that, we wanted to bring that story, the committee wanted to bring that story uh, to the public. And just to give, let the public have some insight on what those men, and also we want to mention the cheerleaders that also participated during that time, what they all experienced, the hard times, the difficult times, and the difference being segregated versus integration. And uh, we just wanted to highlight uh, the major difference uh, of what growing up and, and, and going to school and participating in uh, in, in uh, athletics and 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 what that looked like. So we hope hopefully we we, we were able, we were going to be able to do that with this booklet that uh, that we are put together called uh, uh, Voices of a Segregated Past. Now Floyd can probably uh, comment. He's also uh, committee member, anything I might have left out. Uh, Clarence has, has been kind of a, a visiting professor. Uh, he, he attends our committee meetings, so we also rely on him for uh, any uh, research information that we might not have on Horse Cave and some of those individuals that participated there at the Horse Cave Colored School uh, during those times. Floyd, let me ask you, why is it um, uh, the East 41? What's the significance of uh, U.S. Uh, Highway 41? Well, you, you know, Bill, I, I really don't know until we did a lot of research. And uh, East 41 was, was like the highway. And uh, everything of uh, East 41, back, back then we didn't have too many interstates that was going from, from uh, um from town to town, so it was just like a U.S. Uh, 41. It was what was the major highway. It's East 41 and 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 the West 41, and so that's how it was kind of uh, set up a little bit. That's how it's got the name of E41, the uh, um, the, um, uh, the 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 highway, which kind of separated. And uh, I guess as we did research, we found out that local teams around there. Uh, in, in in that particular area was was designated in in, in a certain region. Uh, just a little bit, uh, piggyback a little bit on what uh, Charlie said, uh, Bill, is that uh, Wafetta Buford is is another committee member, and uh, Don Alford is another committee member. We have about seven committee members, and what through the vision of Alonzo Webb and Rick Starks, what we got together is to want to. Um, basically show the, the, the next generation what it was really like, uh, uh, the, 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 um, the obstacles that, that, and the challenges that 
uh, gone on in the past and what you had to do. And so it, it, it came, the project came more as, as an inspiration not to give up, that you can really achieve whatever you want to achieve. Uh, yes, there's going to be some setbacks. There's going to be some challenges. But perseverance was, 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 was the main key. And then on the shoulders of the giants that uh, preceded us, we wanted to give them some recognition. Uh, this booklet, I think, uh, in essence, Bill kind of tells it from a player's perspective. A lot of times booklets and books come from uh, authors and their perception or whatever. But I, I hope that everyone would get uh, and would see from a player's perspective the, the oral history, the stories that went on, the conditions that, that and the challenges that happened. And we also included the cheerleaders to give their perspective also. Because it was one that was everybody was involved, and there's a, a tremendous amount of community support and pride and and uh, 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 adjustments for for players back in then. So it, it's the 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 booklet is is awesome, and like I say, it's we hope we we sold it from a, a player's perspective. I think Bill, and and we only we narrowed things down to E41, which was our region, which is South Central region. So that's how it really gets its name, E41, probably. Yeah, Floyd, uh, Charlie, and Clarence, let me um, uh, tell our listeners that uh, the the region ran from Hopkinsville to Madisonville in the west. Uh, it included Elkton and Todd County, Elkton, Todd County, Drakesboro uh, Community High School, uh, Russellville, Knob City High School, Bowling Green, Franklin, Horse Cave Colored, uh, and Glasgow, uh, Ralph Bunch. So those are the schools that um, uh, that I understand made up the region, and they they you all competed against them uh, all throughout uh, basketball season. And I would imagine your other sports, uh, Charlie. You said you did some track and field. Were you also competing against those same uh, all uh, segregated schools in track and field? Well, Bill, there were. There are, now, we're mainly talking about the uh, third region, which included those uh, schools that you just mentioned. And I'll go back, and you asked that question about the East 41. The East 41 was a corridor, a corridor that connected those schools pretty much that's in the, in the, uh, in the third region, which was uh, Glasgow, Bowling Green, Elton, uh, Drakesboro, Cause Cave, uh, Russellville, we were kind of all connected through that East 41 uh, U.S. highway, you know. So uh, that's how we mainly come up with that uh, with that subject uh, and that title. Uh, so you, you mainly competed against those schools in all sports? Well, these are schools that com- competed against each other in the third region. Okay. Now, this was before my time, Bill. Okay, I'm old, but I'm not that old. <laughs> okay, this was before my time. I was probably in the elementary uh, school during that time that we are talking about, you know, starting from 1932 to 1957 uh, or 58. So uh, I got a chance to watch some of those players play, which more or less inspired me to want to be a basketball player. You know, a lot of the players that uh, Ralph Bunch, uh, stars like Stanley Herndon, Charles Mansfield, uh, uh, Ernest Stockton, uh, you know, Gene Wells, Lord Esther Whitlow, Calvin Edmonds. These are just some of the guys that was our idols when we were coming up young and wanted to be like them. We wanted to, we didn't want to be like Mike. We wanted to be like them. Okay. We'll have more on voices from the segregated past after we hear from our friends at Spalding University. The Spalding University School of Creative and Professional Writing offers students intellectual rigor, emotional support, affordability, flexibility, and community at the world's first certified compassionate university. From certificate to terminal degree, the programs at Spalding School of Writing foster lifelong writing habits and help you forge a lasting writing community. Learn more at spalding.edu slash school of writing or email school of writing at spalding.edu. 
I'm talking with Floyd Bridges, uh, Charles Hunter, and Clarence Glover. Uh, they are participants uh, in a booklet that is going to be available to the public. And uh, let me just, um, uh, gentlemen, if you don't mind, uh, tell uh, the listeners a little bit about uh, the Voices of the Segregated Past and where it will be on display. Um, the booklet, uh, by that title, will be on display at the South Central Cultural Center uh, in Glasgow, Kentucky. Uh, that's a, a partnership that they have the, with Glasgow's Mary Wood Weldon Library. The exhibit uh, where the Voices from the Segregated Past is a Kentucky Humanities Museum on Main Street called Crossroads. Uh, we've already taken Crossroads to Trimble County, to the River Discovery Center down in Paducah. Uh, it'll also be in Paris and Loretto uh, as part of our Museum on Main Street exhibit across Kentucky. Uh, Crossroads is about uh, the intersection where rural uh, America, rural Kentucky meets the urban and how rural uh, America in places that we all grew up uh, is changing and and uh, whether it will ever be the same again. And let me just share this with you. In 1900, about 40% of Americans lived in rural areas, 40%. By 2010, less than 18% of the U.S. population lived in rural areas. In just over a century, massive economic and social changes led to massive growth of America's urban areas, yet less than 10% of the U.S. landmass is considered urban. Uh, many Americans assume that rural communities are endangered by and, and just barely getting by, suffering from out-migration, ailing schools, and overused land. But that perception is far from truth in many areas. Many rural Americans work hard to sustain their communities. And the questions that are asked is, why should revitalizing the rural places left behind matter to those who remain, those who left, and those who will come into the future. So that is a little bit about the Crossroads exhibit. It's an outstanding display of Smithsonian uh, type of uh, exhibits. Uh, exp it's interactive. It explains the story. It's great for all of us, adults, children. There'll be a lot of school children hopefully will visit. Now, I have to admit to you that uh, COVID, the pandemic, has hurt some of our participation in some of these cities. Uh, people have just not been able to, to get to the museum sites. But uh, this one in Glasgow uh, will open. Uh, it's going to run from April the 10th uh, through the May 15th, April 10th through May 15th. And as a part of this, and I'm going to say a, a, a real key part of this is Voices of the Segregated Past, uh, the booklet that we're discussing. Clarence, you um, you mentioned the, uh, the 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 colored school, and that's that's not a, a term that uh, we use anymore. But um, uh, it, it's it's on that school, and I think there's another one that maybe still had that label. And of course, uh, back in the time that we're talking about in the in the late 30s, 40s, and 50s, uh, that was that was commonplace. Um, tell me about what you remember uh, about the integration process that went on there um, and uh, that didn't go on in other places for a while. Uh, tell me what you remember growing up in, in Horse Cave. The integration process in Horse Cave went extremely smooth, in my estimation, with me seeing it as a fifth grade student. Uh, retrospectively, real quick, I'll only take 15 seconds. The reason I'm sitting here today is, number one, is because you invited me, and I appreciate that. Secondly is uh, I'm sitting here because Rick Starks called me, asked me to be a member of the committee, which I had to decline. But he said Floyd Bridges had him to call me, and I said, uh, in honor of Floyd, I will sit in on your meetings as a consultant, but I cannot be on your committee. Uh, when we go back to Horse Cave, I lived in Henrytown, which was a segment where African-American people lived in Horse Cave. Mr. Ralph Dorsey, who was my, became my mentor after integration, Mr. Newton S. Thomas, who coached the Horse Cave College School basketball team that I knew absolutely nothing about as a fourth grader uh, because I 
didn't go to those games or any of those things. So it was not until later that I learned that a person became a kind of a mentor to me, although he was not around that much, by the name of Clarence Wilson. He and his cousin, Carl Cecil Helen, were the stars of the Horse Cave team that won the National Black and National Colored Tournament in 1944 and 45, 46. Those overlap in two years. And they became kind of the stars of the E41 in a sense because they went to the highest level that a black player could go at that time. And that was to the Harlem Globetrotters. And they both played on the Harlem Globetrotters and Clarence became the coach of the Harlem Globetrotters. The smoothness of the transition from Horse Cave College School was that Mr. Newton Thomas and Mr. Ralph Dorsey worked with community members who were white and of color to make sure that everything went smoothly. Whereas that other school districts had problems, other school districts did not integrate their students until later. Mr. Dorsey and Mr. Thomas led the way. Mr. Thomas became the, he was the only black teacher that actually matriculated over to Caverna. And he became the first African-American teacher in the Commonwealth of Kentucky to teach in a formerly all-white school. So the integration process went smoothly. There were a couple of things that took place uh, that were the types of things that take place every place where there was a fight or two or something of that nature and between a person of color and a person that was considered Caucasian. Charlie, uh, Clarence, what um, what year was the, uh, the Caverna School uh, uh, integrated? I think we were 55, 56. Yeah, that, that's fine. I think you're right. I think it was about that time. So, uh, Charlie and, and Floyd, um, we we grew up in Glasgow, 20 miles from Horse Cave, eight, eight, 15 miles from Horse Cave. Glasgow City Schools uh, did not integrate until 1965. Why the 10 year? Have you ever wondered? I, I've never been that curious to ask this question before. Why would one school in a in a smaller town uh, than Glasgow integrate 10 years before Glasgow? Have you ever talked with anyone about that or what? what's your own thought process about that? Floyd? Well, well, my thought process is that it, at the time you didn't really realize it. Uh, and, and being as young as we were, we didn't think anything about that. Uh, I think the Supreme Court was uh, the decision to integrate was 1954. And so it was at delivered speed. So it just took us a little long time to 10 years later before we finally uh, integrated. But, you know, I, I think as as our community, everybody got along with everybody. And, and there was really uh, uh, no, uh, no, no problems for us, race relations. And so I, I think. Maybe there was probably some anxiety and because uh, in other different uh, uh, areas, particularly in the South, there was a lot of violence and stuff was going on. And I guess as a community in Glasgow, I can speak to that. We didn't have any problems at all. Everybody kind of got along and, and, and whatever. And, and so it was just, um, I guess, just getting up to speed or whatever. But I've also, as, a, as an adult, I've also I'll, always wondered why it took 10 years to, to, to accomplish that. And uh, I, I just go back to, I talked to Coach Richards in, uh, in Bowling Green now. He, he claims that, that if we would have integrated a little bit earlier, he might have a, a few more state championships. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's Coach Jim Richards who coached at Glasgow and, and then went on to Western uh, and did, of course, very well there. Um, and he would say that, wouldn't he? Um, Charlie, what, what's, your, what's your thought about that? Well, you know, Bill, as you mentioned earlier about your dad, you know, coming down the bunch and watching us play, and I think you also said you was there as well. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was always amazing that uh, – and, and there were quite a few, you know, white uh, citizens there in Glasgow that came, to, came down the bunch and watch us play. And uh, – as we all know, you know, and the history kind of uh, that kind of led to, or at least 
contributed to uh, schools integrating probably was through sports. I think we were able probably to become closer and, and probably have a little better relations through sports than we did probably maybe at the academic level in the beginning. So as Floyd mentioned, there was somewhat a, a pretty smooth transition. As far as I know, I was already gone and, and, and was there in Oklahoma City. Uh, and uh, But I never heard of any major incidents uh, when the school integrated in Glasgow. And as far as I knew, uh, you know, and like Clarence said, there was going to be a few, you know, incidents because there were, you know, I'm sure there were kids that were, had grown up, uh, had been more or less taught about, you know, uh, and probably never been in associations with African-Americans. So all of a sudden now they're going to school, sitting beside African-Americans in classrooms. So I'm sure that for, the, for some of them, it's going to be quite a shock, you know. So there was some getting used to and adjusting that I think was probably required on both sides, both black and white. So uh, now why the schools never uh, uh, hadn't integrated uh, prior to that time, one could probably only think about the community leaders and, uh, and, and who was probably, and what their, I guess, their thoughts were about integration, integrating schools, and whether or not they felt it was the right time to do it. So I'm pretty sure that probably played a big part. Well, I think um, a lot of the reason for progress, and and quite frankly, I, I think we we probably all share uh, how proud we are of um, of of many of the citizens and and of the ball players that went on to to be quite successful. But one individual has always stood out to me uh, in my life is Luska Twyman, and. Uh, Luska, to me, um, was always representative of um, of the relationship that blacks and whites had in Glasgow. But he also uh, it was pointed out to me many times. You're from Glasgow. Isn't that the Luska Twyman, the first black mayor of a city in Kentucky? Oh, yes. I'm we're, we're all very proud of that. But but am I incorrect in thinking that that Mr. Twyman had uh, a part in this athletic um, this this athletic conference in some way was was he a teacher or a coach at at bunch uh yes uh, 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 principal Twyman uh, was uh, the first uh, coach he and uh, uh, mr uh, Connolly who was a history civics teacher there at bunch were our first coaches at Ralph bunch. Hmm. Uh, not at Ralph, yeah, at Ralph Bunch. And, uh, you know, at that time, we did not have a gym. And uh, the, you know, the uh, the athletes uh, practiced and played at the Armory there in, in Glasgow. And, uh, and so, uh, uh, but Mr. Twyman was the first basketball coach at Ralph Bunch High School. And, and then uh, for listeners again, um, went on uh, to uh, to become mayor and, and w- stayed uh, as mayor in Glasgow for uh, many long years. I, I, I don't know exactly the number of years. I should know that, but I, tw- 20 years or something like that. I mean, for a, quite a long time. I'd heard the number. I think it might have been, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, it might have been about 17 years, Bill. I, I don't know. Between 17, 20, I guess. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Bill. Bill, uh, two other icons that I, I, I kind of wanted to just mention, and that was uh, uh, Hank Ross, the, 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 the late, great Hank Ross that came down to Bunch and, and uh, uh, um, uh, 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 told our stories and, and, and had us on the radio back then. Radio was really king. And also the late, um, great uh, Joel Wilson, which was, which, which was a photographer, which was the editor of the uh, Glasgow Daily Times. They was two of the community members that was instrumental in in keeping the uh, uh, the publicity and 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 getting the word out about athletics and whatever. And and, and like I say, of course, uh, uh, Mr. Twyman, who who uh, uh, aspired to to having education, and that was his main focus. And he inspired 
Charlie and myself and, and all the students at Rap Bunch to, to go on further. And as you know, uh, uh, he graduated from, from Indiana University at a, at a time when they, they were accepting very few um, uh, 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 Black students at, at that university with honors and whatever. So those are three really icons that, that helped with the transition, I'm, I'm sure, of, of doing things. Now, Bill, I will also mention some of the other fans uh, that was pretty much, uh, you know, just about at every game that we played, you know, I would see him in the stands was Mr. Joe Goodman, uh, his son, Joe, the third, either Joe, the third or Joe, yes. Joe, the third. Yeah. Uh, and his, uh, Joe Jr. Uh, I think, uh, uh Joe, the second. Okay. I, I never could get them all. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, they're cousins of mine and I can't keep them straight either. <laughs> But I was very uh, good friends with both Mr. Goodman and, and his sons. As a matter of yeah. fact, um, after my uh, freshman year, I came back to Glasgow and I worked worked there at Goodman Oldsmobile and Cadillac during the summer, you know, and, and Joe, Joe the third and I, we worked together. You know, we were about, we were about the same age. No, I'm going to say, Charlie, you worked – uh, <laughs> Joe just kind of stood by and watched you probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, we both, we all had, you know, we had a good time. And uh, I mean, I, I wasn't working too hard myself, Bill. <laughs> so, uh, uh, is there somebody else you wanted to mention? Did, did you have another name or is that just uh, Joe was, McKinney? Yeah. Uh, a yeah. Lot of people might not remember Joe McKinney, but he was the first uh, sports writer. I think was it the Republican? Was that the paper? Glasgow Republican, yes. Uh huh. At that time, two two papers there. Yeah. He preceded uh, uh, Joe uh, Joe Joel Wilson. You know, he gave us a lot of write ups. You know, and uh, were, really was a big proponent of mine that uh, promoted me as a player. You know, there in Glasgow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bill, I, one quick statement, if I could, and this is just in retrospect with the. Uh, with the segregated past, I think that they've done a great job. It was a tough, it was a tough thing to do because these gentlemen are in the eighties up toward 90 years of age. And so Alonzo Webb did many of the interviews in person. And then they sent out, uh, they sent out information for people to send that fill out. They made telephone calls to relatives, et cetera. And so it was a it was a tough thing for them to do to come to this point. I've sat in on their meetings and listened to them. They were like a family, which means that families don't always get along at the very beginning or sometimes at the end. But at the end, they always came out smiling and and with each other. I purposely did not become a member of the committee so that I could sit from the outside and watch this family dynamics take place. I think that anybody that sees the final product, is going to be pleased with it. If they go to the crossroads there in Glasgow, I think they'd be pleased with whatever they see from humanities, because if you take the first five letters in the humanities, then you've got what humanities has been doing in Kentucky. That's part of the reason that I'm on the board of directors. So it's not just rural crossroads. It's a lot more that has taken place from hometown heroes all the way through. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be part of this board. But I'm also very pleased to have sit in on the forces of the segregated past with, with the great Charles Big Game Hunter. Uh, and, of course, with Floyd Bridges, who was a great player in his own right that I did see play in a faculty student game at Fulton Junior High uh, as he shot his jump shot and then back held down the court. <laughs> I wanted to get that in before, and we may have more time, but I wanted to get that in about forces of the segregated past. Well, Clarence, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, we're very uh, proud and, and pleased to have you as a board member of Kentucky Humanities. And uh, Floyd and, and Charlie, I, I want to tell you what a, uh, a delight this has been for me and what a, what a, um, um, how how uh, I've enjoyed this so much and, and thinking about uh, when when all of us were we're growing up in uh, in I, what I consider uh, still today to be one of the finest uh, small towns in America, and we I think we're very uh, lucky in some respects to to share that. Um, 
Once again, the Museum on Main Street a Crossroads exhibit opens in uh, on April the 10th. Uh, and it runs through May 15th, so you have plenty of time. Hopefully, some of this uh, pandemic uh, precaution is going to be uh, lifted and people will get to visit uh, and see the exhibit. But they will also have uh, on display uh, the booklet of Voices of the Segregated Past. Um, and I know that um, uh, people will be, as Clarence said, uh, I've seen it uh, in a uh, a rough draft form, uh, and uh, it, it's it, it's just fascinating, really, to read about uh, all the players and and cheerleaders, as Charlie pointed out uh, before, uh, that really uh, were such an important part of of um, legacy and, and and in Glasgow and uh, and all these other schools too. I mean, it's not just in in Barron County; it goes to the to the uh, entire uh, E forty one group of schools. And I think um, I think there's going to be some real interest in this, uh, uh, gentlemen. Uh, you've done a you've done a really uh, good thing for for history, which we believe very much in at Kentucky Humanities, uh, and and very much uh, you've done a good thing for for Kentucky. And uh, I think it's going to be I think it's going to be well received. So um, hang on and hang in there and. Um, and uh, people will be contacting you about this. I, I really believe that. Charlie, did you want to have a, a final word? I would just like to say that uh, uh, we need to give a lot of credit to uh, Jimmy Stockton, who pretty much wrote the narrative <clears throat> for this book, and uh, and all the uh, committee members uh, that contributed. Floyd, Don Alfred, who uh, attended uh, uh, Bowling Green High Street, and Miss Wathetta Buford who was our secretary, had done an outstanding job taking our notes. And uh, and let's see, uh, Rick and and uh, Rick being the chairperson, I think Ron, uh, Lonnie's been the co-chair. Uh, and I would have to say, I have to take my hat off. And they have all, we have all, I think, have done an uh, outstanding job. And this wasn't easy. No. You know, it wasn't easy at all to try to go back and bring all that to the forefront and 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 kind of lay it out and, and and put it in a way that we've been able to do it and hopefully that it will be well accepted by you know by the community and and people that gets a chance to read it will uh will say a job well done a gentleman uh, thank you once again uh, i hope to uh to see you in person someday and and uh, shake your hand and and we'll have other reminiscences and and conversations about our our hometown. And uh, also thanks to Sherry Wesley, executive director of the Barron County Cultural Center, where Crossroads exhibit is on display through May 15th. Thanks for listening to Think Humanities. Think Humanities is a podcast from Kentucky Humanities, where we have been telling Kentucky's story for 49 years. Think Humanities is available at kyhumanities.org, iTunes, and SoundCloud. Join us next week for a new episode of Think Humanities.